Hello and welcome to a very cold week four. Uh, today is going to be cold, tomorrow is going to be cold, and then it's going to be cold um, during the weekend. So be prepared, be bundled up. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Hebrews and Judaism. And this is a topic that can be touchy for some because it does involve religion. Uh, for others, it's okay. Um, but I always like to say that when you talk about religion, it can be upsetting to some people, but it'll be okay. Now, a little bit of background about the Hebrews. Uh, first of all, they are relatively significant people. Uh, they don't dominate their region, so it's not like the Chinese Empire, it's not like all the empires of India, it's not like the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians. They, they never dominate the area they live in. They don't dominate militarily, they don't dominate politically. But even though they're a relatively insignificant group of people, they have this outsized role in shaping the world around us. Whether you believe in Judaism or not, they have affected the world we live in. <clears throat> According to tradition, the patriarch or the creator, the, the oldest Hebrew, if you will, was a man named Abraham. Now, historically, we don't know for sure if Abraham lived religiously. That's a different story. I'm going to try to stay on the political or the um, the historical side of things here for a moment. Um, Abraham is seen as the patriarch of the Hebrew people. Whether he really existed or not, that is how historians kind of track this down. He was probably from a Sumerian city named Ur, which was one of the large Sumerian cities, along with Ur, Uruk, Nippur, things like that. Um, why he would have left, we don't know. Um, if he did live, it was somewhere probably between 1900 BC and 1500 BC that this happened. Uh, he migrated into southern Syria, northern Lebanon. Uh, that would be the modern day equivalent. <clears throat> And he set up life uh, in that area of the world. When he arrives at his new home in southern Syria, according to tradition, uh, he comes into contact with a god named Yahweh. Now, this god named Yahweh was slightly different than other gods in the area in that um, Yahweh is supposed to operate on the idea of righteousness and good morals, good faith. Abraham makes a covenant or a promise, an agreement, if you will, with Yahweh to serve Yahweh. Now, before this happens, the Hebrews were probably polytheistic, and the reason we suspect that is well, everybody else in the area was polytheistic. So it kind of makes sense to assume that from a historical and an anthropological standpoint. Now, Abraham sees that the Hebrews, or believes that the Hebrews, have been appointed by Yahweh to spread the message of Yahweh to other people in the area. And this is supposed to be a message of purity, a message of of righteousness, of good versus evil. And the way that someone knew if you were Hebrew or not was circumcision in men. Now, this somewhat separated the Hebrews from other people in the area because polytheism was very strong in the Middle East at the time. So, While the early Hebrews are not monotheistic, they have chosen to follow one particular God over everybody else. Now, eventually, the Hebrews are going to become known as the Israelites. So a Hebrew and an Israelite are the same thing.
Now, moving on, according to tradition, also the Israelites were the Hebrews. Uh, they become slaves in the Egyptian New Kingdom, uh, the same Egyptian New Kingdom that we talked about last week. Moses becomes the leader of the Israelites somewhere around 1250 BC and then leads them into the desert. Now, this is where the historical record and the religious record kind of change a little bit. There is some evidence of the Israelites living in Egypt. However, they were not slaves. Uh, there is no record in Egyptian history of Moses, but that in no way says that this isn't a true story. We just don't know everything. There is even a growing theory amongst some Egyptologists that Akhenaten from last week could be Moses. Maybe we'll have an answer one day. Maybe the answer is something that we'll never find. I don't know. But according to tradition, while the Israelites are in the Sinai desert, Moses receives the law of Yahweh, which is better known as the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> Now, when Moses receives this covenant of the Ten Commandments, or the Law of Yahweh, that's when Yahweh becomes the only God of the Israelites. Prior to this, the Hebrews practiced what was called a monolatry. It's a fancy word, monolatry, that basically says that they worshipped one God, but still believe that others existed. It's the acceptance of the Ten Commandments, the acceptance of the Law of Yahweh that changes them from there are other gods, but this is, a, this is ours, to there are no other gods, only Yahweh. So it's a big change in the history of the Hebrews. Now, it's not the first instance of monotheism in the world. There is an older religion called Zoroastrianism. This monotheistic religion that's created by the Israelites or the Hebrews becomes the first really big one. Now, the commandments that are given to Moses they lay out the basic beliefs of the Jewish ethical system. Um, even if you're somebody who's not a practicing Jewish person, you probably have seen or heard the Ten Commandments somewhere in your life. And if you read them, the first four commandments, they deal with human obligations to Yahweh. How people are supposed to treat Yahweh, look at Yahweh, and worship him. But the other six deal with relationships between people. Honor thy mother, honor thy father, don't covet thy neighbor, things like that. So that really becomes the basic ethical system of Judaism. And it's not just a religious text. Now, a big question people have are, what are the basics of Judaism? What makes it different from what was already there? First of all, God or Yahweh and nature are separate. In traditional religions in the area, the gods represented nature. Uh, think of Enlil, or not in yeah, um, Enlil was the Sumerian god of rain, and whenever it didn't rain, the people thought that they had made Enlil mad. When it was too dry, people thought that they made Enlil mad. Well, in Judaism, the Israelites said, no, God and nature are separate. Yahweh is above nature and superior to nature. In Judaism, Yahweh or God is seen as a moral being. In some of the other religions in the area, um, the gods interact directly with the people sometimes in immoral ways. All you have to do is look at Zeus in ancient Greece. 
Uh, Zeus was a womanizer and a drunk in many ways. But in Judaism, Yahweh was seen as being above that. Yahweh is a moral being, a just being. Uh, <clears throat> so that sets them apart as well. Yahweh demanded ethical behavior. Yahweh let his believers know what was expected and what to do, what not to do. And Judaism was also different because in their belief system, the material world and the separate or the spiritual world are not separate. They're one and the same. The human body and the human spirit are part of a whole being. In Judaism, it's believed that Yahweh could inhabit the human body. And even after death, it was believed that the spirits of the Jewish people would remain on earth for, I believe it's a year before they can finally go to whatever their final resting place might be. Overall, in Hebrew religion, or in Judaism, as it becomes known, uh, Yahweh is seen as a god who cared and took part in the affairs of humans. Unlike some of the other gods who are basically indifferent and use humans whenever it pleases them or whenever some sort of sacrifice or ritual was given. Now, there are two holy books of Judaism. Uh, one book is called the Torah, and the other is the Talmud. Now, what are these? Well, the Torah, it's also known as the Pentateuch or Pentateuch. I unfortunately don't speak uh, Judaic languages, but I think it's Pentateuch. And this is really, if you're more familiar with the Christian Bible, it's the first five books of the Christian Bible. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, if you've ever read the Old Testament, you know that there's a lot of so-and-so, son of so-and-so, son and so-and-so, and it goes on for pages and pages and pages. Why is that important? Why is all of that in there? Well, it's because to the Jewish people, the Torah is not just a religious book. It's also a book of their history. It's a book of their genealogy. It has their laws. It has their poetry. And it tells a lot about the culture of ancient Hebrews. So when you read the Old Testament and you, you ask yourself, well, why is all this extra stuff in there? It's because it wasn't just a religious book. It was an everything book to them. The other important thing to know is the Torah was originally not written down. Our best guesses are it was written around 1300 BC in its relatively modern form. Prior to that, it was all passed down orally. It was an oral tradition. The other book, the Talmud, it's much newer. Uh, our estimates are somewhere around 400 to 500 AD is when the Talmud was written. And think of it kind of like a set of instructions. It's almost like a primary source on how to understand Jewish law and Jewish theology. And the Talmud, it's taught by rabbis, and the word rabbi means teacher in Hebrew. So the Talmud, it's the writings, it's the, the directions, it's the instructions of the rabbis who have studied the Torah. Basically, think of it kind of like a how-to guide, if you will. And the Talmud has two different parts. There's the Mishnah, which are the oral traditions, the oral stories who are written down, and then something called the Gemara, which is the analysis of the Torah and commentary on the Torah. Now, what happens to the Israelites? Uh, some of this is historical. Some of this is religious-based. But for whatever reason, um, 
the kingdom of Israel is going to be divided into two parts. There's the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. Uh, we do know 100% for sure that the kingdom of Israel is destroyed by Assyria in 722 BC. That's right when Assyrians are attacking Egypt and Israel was basically a stop on the way to conquering Egypt. The kingdom of Judah is going to last a little bit longer until right around 585, 586 BC when the Neo-Babylonians or the Chaldonians from our Mesopotamia lesson are going to defeat the kingdom of Judah and many of the citizens of the kingdom of Judah are going to be taken as slaves. And this is the famous Babylonian captivity from the Old Testament. The Neo-Babylonians are going to keep the Israelites or the Jewish people as slaves until New or Neo-Babylonia is conquered by Persia. After that happens, according to tradition, uh, the Jewish people go back to Israel for a short amount of time. Eventually, the Roman Empire is going to conquer the area that we know today as Israel. And the Jewish people are going to be spread throughout the ancient world between their release from the Babylonian captivity and a revolt against Rome that happens in 73 AD. Uh, just another interesting thing is there are not very many Jewish people in Israel from the early 100s until 1945. Uh, Jewish people do not come back to Israel in large numbers until after World War II. All right, so a couple other things here. Let me pull up the course calendar. You'll see for this week, due by the 8th, which is next Monday night at 11.59 p.m., you have your fourth discussion that's due. You have your fourth quiz that is due. But then you have this reflection paper number one. Now, you may be asking, well, what is a reflection paper? Well, I'm always going to tell you to look at the syllabus because the syllabus has the information on it. But you can also look here on the reflection paper Dropbox, and you can see your due date right there. And a reminder, there are a total of four reflection papers to complete during the semester, each worth 5%. The reflection paper should focus on one of the assigned readings found within the Blackboard Lessons folder. Please use your first paragraph to quickly summarize the article you've chosen to reflect on. For the remainder of the paper, please give your thoughts, opinions, and ideas of the article that you've chosen. The best reflection papers are one and a half to two pages in length, make it sure it's double spaced, and provide a clear opinion or idea and is convincing as to why you feel as you do. Now for reflection paper one, you're going to use any reading from lesson one, two, or three. So for lesson one, just a real quick reminder, online readings, it could be the new women of the ice age, introduction to prehistoric art, or a brief look at Neanderthals. For lesson two, it could be the Epic of Gilgamesh. It could be the Code of Hammurabi. Or for lesson three, you could use any of the books or any of the articles, I should say, about ancient Egypt. Now let's say that when you were reading through the articles and the article, Advice to Ambitious Young Egyptians, Rise Above the Masses, Become a Scribe, you really like that one. What you would do is reread that article, take your first paragraph, and just give me a quick summary of the article. Ancient Egyptians thought that being a scribe was noble, um, it 
looked good on your resume and it was easier work than being a slave or whatever it might be. Then for the rest of it, I want you to kind of think about how that article made you feel or what your thoughts of the article were. If you loved it, if you understood why the Egyptians wanted to be a scribe, write about that. If you thought being a scribe was overrated and you don't understand why, what the big deal was, write about that too. The purpose of these reflection papers is to make you think independently and come up with your own ideas, your own thoughts, your own opinions. Now, I promise we all have opinions. Everybody has a favorite color. Everybody has a favorite book, a favorite movie. So you have opinions, even if you don't realize it. And this is just forming an opinion on something that maybe interested you, or maybe you thought the advice of the ambitious young Egyptians was the worst article out of them. That's a good opinion too. I hated this article because X, Y, Z. But the most important thing is be able to form an opinion and make sure that I understand why you feel the way you do. All right, last but not least, because uh, we're running up on about the 25 minute mark here. Um, I promised you in one of the earlier lectures that I would occasionally give extra credit. This is one of those moments. Uh, it is February 2nd, Groundhog Day. If you send me a message in Blackboard by Friday, and we'll say Friday at 9 p.m. If you send me an email within Blackboard, one of these Blackboard messages, by Friday at 9 p.m. with the word Bluey, B-L-U-E-Y, I will give you five extra points on your week three quiz. So once again, if you send me by 9 p.m. Friday the word Bluey, B-L-U-E-Y, in a Blackboard message, I will give you five extra points on your week three quiz. Now, if you're asking why Bluey, it's because it's my three-year-old's favorite TV show. All right, until next time, good luck with your reflection papers. If you have any questions, email me. Good luck with your quiz, discussion, and get back to me with that secret word. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.